thank you very much for having me. Thank you to Sean and to Christina. Um, I am, in fact, an international house trained teacher. I did my Salto in Piccadilly quite a long time ago. I won't mention how long ago. I then worked at IH Barcelona for many, many years, and I've also worked, and I did work regularly at IH London in the summers. So I also have a very strong connection with IH, um, and it's a bit like coming home, seeing all of you here, IH teachers and trainers. Also, I need to warn you, being an IH trained teacher means that there will be pair work during this session. So. <laughs> Okay, um, do we have any Canadians in the audience? One, two, lovely, good. Americans? None? Okay. People who've been to Canada, can you put up your hand? Visited Canada? Great. Okay, now in Canada, the west hand side of the country, the left hand side, there's a big state there. Do you know what it's called? The Canadians must know. It's a big Sorry, province, big province. <laughs> Oops, yes, the states are in the states. British Columbia is the kind of western part of Canada, and it has a specific name, that region, British Columbia, plus, plus a little bit further down into the states, around the Seattle area. That sort of geographic region has a specific name. Do you know what it is? Yes, it's called the Pacific Northwest. You might have heard of it. Right, those of you who have visited the Pacific Northwest, could you put up your hand, either in the states or in Canada? Few of you, okay. Well, there's one word, really, that sums it up, and that is gorgeous. It's absolutely stunning. And I was lucky enough to go there last summer. I have family who live in Vancouver, and I had my first trip to uh, Vancouver and the Pacific Northwest. I have a very good friend who lives in Seattle, so I went down to Seattle as well. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I live in Barcelona, in Spain, and I'm very keen on hiking. I often go up to the Pyrenees and hiking and so on, and nature. So for me, going over to Canada, where you have fantastic mountains, fantastic scenery with a lot less people. I was very much looking forward to. Um, I did a little bit of research about the area because I wanted to go on some hikes. And there's a kind of a peninsula near Seattle which is called the Olympic Peninsula. It's very wild, very unspoiled, very beautiful, and it's home to many endangered animals. For example, <coughs> there are some of them. Let's see if you recognize them. Um, starting on the sort of one o'clock top right, do you know what animal that is? Yes, I think it's the humpback whale, yeah, it's uh, endangered. And then we've got the bottom right hand side? It's bald eagle, it's bald eagle yeah. Um, in the middle there? Yes, yeah, there's a rock with something very, very small and black on it. It's actually it's, it's some kind of seabird, but there are a lot of seabirds that are in danger of extinction in this region. It has very specific flora and fauna. Uh, the bottom left-hand animal, do you know that one? It's kind of a puma. It's called something different in that part of the world. A cougar. It's a cougar. Yeah, yeah. These are all endangered. And I also found out about a very little-known endangered species, which is the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. And I hadn't heard much about that. I thought that's fascinating. So I got onto the internet you know, in, researched it all, went off to the Pacific Northwest. I managed to see some of the animals. I saw um, the eagle and some whales. We went whale watching. And unfortunately, I didn't get to see the, um, the tree octopus. Although it's a very interesting creature. And, oops, I'm gonna give you some information about the tree octopus. And I'd like you to think what what possible information uh, does this refer to? So what do you think the average size is? What does it use its tentacles for? Color, how is that relevant? I'll just give you a moment in pairs, as I said, or in threes. Up you go. <laughs> All right, let's see what you've got. Um, so it clearly lives in the rainforest in, that, uh, in the Olympic Peninsula. What sort of size do you think it is from the photo, more or less? <laughs> You're not taking this seriously, I can tell. Um, okay, I've, I've taken the information off the website. Now, of course, if you were students, I would actually send you to the website to go and check it out, but I'll just tell you the answers. Um, average size is 30 to 33 centimeters. What about the tentacles? What do you think they use their tentacles for? Yeah, exactly. They pull themselves along. Also, to strike at insects or small vertebrae. And also to examine objects that they might find interesting. What about uh, the skin color? How's that? What? 
Green? Brown, brown, brown in the photo there. But very interesting because they use their skin's color to display emotions. So for example, um, red indicates anger, white indicates fear, but they're normally this kind of brown color. All right, what about predators, possible predators? Yes, exactly, yeah. So they've got natural or native speech species, such as the bald eagle, and also foreign species, for example, house cats. Uh, those are also apparently a real danger. Poor octopus. All right, one way you could help save the species. Don't cut down trees, absolutely, yeah. Don't destroy the natural habitat, yeah. Don't eat it, yeah. True, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're all socially conscious teachers, that's wonderful. In fact, the website has some very, very good recommendations, and those are, for example, write to your political representatives and tell them you're concerned about this animal, being, and it should be you know, clearly labeled on the endangered species list, because I hadn't heard of it before. Um, you need to tell your friends about it and your co-workers. You can put um, a tentacle ribbon on your website. I'll show you one in a second. Um, this is my favorite one. You can take part in tree octopus awareness marches. <laughs> Being Brits, you'll all like that one. Pamphlet your neighborhood. Donate to the organization. Boycott companies that use non-tree octopus safe wood harvesting practices. Yeah, sign an online petition. So lots of, lots of things. Okay, so by now you've probably realized that the tree octopus doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. I know, it's disappointing, isn't it? But there is a wonderful website dedicated to it. I'm going to give you a, a handout at the end with all of the websites and more that we're talking about, okay? So you don't need to write down any addresses. There it is. It's fabulous. It's got you know, all those tabs across the, to the top. It's got photos. It's got video footage of octopus sightings. It's really, really quite wonderful. It's been put together with a lot of love and a lot of humor. So what we've done then is just the introduction to a class. Yeah, I told my little story, which is true. I did go to, to Vancouver in the summer, in fact, um, and it is beautiful. Um, we've done the introduction. We did the prediction activity, which was that grid thing. And then I would send students to the site, and I just gave you the answers. So let's have a look at the site in a little bit more detail. It's, I know this is a screenshot, so it's not very clear for you. You won't be able to read it. But there are a couple of things that tell you that this is not a real website, that it's not true. And these are some of the elements, OK? So the next stage now is to get students to actually look at these little elements, and they can see the website properly, which you can't, and to explore them. So I'll just give you, again, another sort of half a minute in your groups to think about how these elements help make the website look more official and more authentic or detract and make it look less serious or less official. Just a minute or so. Okay, I'm gonna stop you. Again, of course, I know you can't really see what's on the screen and the students would be able to click on the tabs and actually explore the site and you, I would give them more time, of course. But let's start off then with the layout, the font, and the colors. What does that tell you about the site? What do you think? What strikes you about it? Playful. Green. Yeah, playful. It's not that serious, is it? The colors, the green is not really right for a sort of an official website. That's one thing, yeah? Anything else? The font you can't really see, but, the, but you can see the title font. The, yeah, it's kind of a word arty thing. It's sort of, it's not quite right for, for the genre, is it? It's, it's a bit kind of schoolish, if you like, yeah. Looks like it's kids, somebody said. Yeah, possibly made by kids, yeah. It's actually made, not, by, not made by kids, but it could be. Ah, for kids, yes, yeah. All right, um, quotes. Well, you can't see, but there are quotes within some of these pages from, you know, esteemed scientists and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it looks very factual, using quotes. It's very, very well written. You, you should go along and have a look at the site. Um, it starts off quite sort of straight, but you soon start to spot that it's quite tongue in cheek. Of course, this for a native speaker or a very high level English learner is quick. You can spot that quickly and easily. But for a language learner, it's less evident if their uh, linguistic abilities are not that um, developed. 
the images and the maps, well, you can see one here on the bottom right-hand side. What effect does that have? Yes, it does. It makes it look more authentic, doesn't it, if you have a map and so on. And again, there's the octopus sightings where there are several photos of it in action, which make it look believable. The YouTube video is brilliant. The video that's on the site of, of the actual sighting is, is really worth seeing. Uh, okay, we've got links. You can't, again, you can't see them, but down here we have, further down here, there are l links to official organizations like the World Wildlife Fund. So that, again, adds a sort of feeling of authenticity. Um, the hyperlinks within the text, what, again, you can't see them, but when you have hyperlinks, it can add authenticity, again, to World Wildlife Fund or, you know, scientists so-and-so, and then you go off to, the, to another site. Uh, the news in the blog, again, you can't see that, but it's kind of regularly updated. So maybe the last entry is about six months ago, so it looks like it's, you know, it ticks over. Uh, and again, there's references to other research which gives it this feeling of authenticity. Then you've got tabs with different content across the top. So you can see it's not just one page. It's actually a whole website. Again, a fairly developed piece of work. And there's a tentacle ribbon on the top left-hand side. If you'd like to add one to your website as part of the movement to protect the tree octopus, that's what you need to do. And you can download it from the site and actually put it on your blog. I mean, you really can. So. Right. Um, so do visit that when you, when you get a chance. So what are we doing here? What, what is this lesson that I've just quickly described to you? What's the point? What are we doing with students? Yes, exactly, okay. But in fact, how did the lesson start? It just started off as a kind of normal EFL reading lesson, didn't it? We had the little intro, which in my case was an anecdote, and some photos of endangered species but I could have introduced the topic any, in any form. Um, and then we had prediction, and then we had reading to check information. So bog standard up to that point. We just used a website as opposed to a textbook reading or some other piece of material. But where things have changed slightly is when we get to this stage, and we get learners to actually analyze what's going on. And this is certainly part, as you say, of digital literacy. It's part of what's called information literacy. How? Well, information, yeah, you go along and you read it, but you do need to be critical. We all know this, okay? But of course, the internet lends itself to particular critical strategies that you can implement. For example, looking at the URL, the web address, in other words. Let's have a look at the URL. Can you see that? It's zap zappatoppy.net forward slash tree octopus forward slash. What does that tell you, that web address? Exactly. Exactly. Who's saying that? I can't see where you are. Yeah. It's not a government organization. It's clearly some guy who's put this up in his backyard just from the URL. So these kinds of strategies, when we are regular internet users, we know this. We know this. But when we're teaching, especially younger learners, they don't. So there's this myth going around that young learners are these digital, so-called digital natives. You may have heard the expression. Yeah, it's not necessarily true. A lot of them are fine with moving the mouse around and you know, playing around and using social networks and so on, but they're not that sussed when it comes to actually you know, assessing and evaluating the veracity of information, as, as with print. Same thing, they need to be taught those critical skills. I think of my own daughter who's 15, She's very confident with technology, but she is completely ignorant of what goes on on the internet. So when I was putting this talk together, I showed her this website to see what she would think. She said, oh, wow, we were going to Canada in the summer. Oh, that's really, wow. She believed everything she saw on there. And when I told her, I said, come on, you know, look, look, at, look at this YouTube video. And she said, oh, she really had, you know, 15. So you think, oh. So these are skills, clearly, that need to be taught. And in fact, they are being integrated into curricula all over the world. So in the UK, there is, you know, the kind of policy documents, if you like, include this focus on, I think they call it media literacy or new media literacy. And it includes a number of elements which we'll look at. Even in Spain, where I live, they've, they've started to uh, try to introduce it into the curriculum. Of course, the big problem is, for teachers, how do I teach it? What is it? And how do I teach it? Okay, so let's have a look at what it is. There are a number of, way, of ways of conceptualizing digital literacies. 
Um, the one that I especially like is this one by Mark Pegram. Mark is a lecturer at the University of Western Australia, and he's come up with this, I think, this very um, thorough way of looking at digital literacies, and he groups them into four sort of areas, if you like. So we've got uh, on the right, focus on language, focus on connections, then we've got information, and then redesign at the top. And within each of these sort of areas, he has a number of sort of sub-literacies or sub-skills. So I'm going to leave you now in your pairs or in your threes just to look at these and see if you can figure out what they probably refer to. A lot of it you'll be able to figure out yourself. So I'll just give you a few minutes. Uh, okay, so what do we have? Um, let's start off then with the focus on language, which Mark feels is one of the most important ones, of course because we use language to communicate. But you'll notice that the uh, literacies inside there aren't just words or language. They are also different media because with the internet we use not just language to communicate but images, video, and we sometimes use images and video to replace spoken language or written language. So these will kind of fit in there. Are there any questions about any of those? Mobile literacy? Mobile literacy? Yeah, what do you think that means? Knowing how to navigate your mobile phone? Yes, exactly. So knowing how to use your mobile phone, knowing how to produce things on your mobile phone, so how to send text messages and so on. Yeah. Okay. Right, technical and coding um, literacy. Any ideas there? How to program. Yeah, I mean, coding refers to programming or producing computer code. Now, that sounds quite scary, and I suspect that there are very few of us in the room who know how to code. If you, know, if you do know a bit about coding, could you put up your hand? I think it'll be a minority. Oh, well, actually, not bad. And I notice you're all men, unless there was a woman there. <laughs> Okay, now, I, I have never studied computing science. I, you know, I'm not interested in the coding part at all. I'm interested in teaching. But I do know a little bit about HTML, which is the most basic kind of computer language. So I know, for example, how if I put a word on my web page and I want it in bold, I know enough to go into the code, read the code, put in a little B and some brackets, around the word and to make it bold. So this is the kind of level of coding that we're talking about, really, really basic. The idea is that knowing how to make these small changes to web content or to templates frees you up a little bit. Otherwise, you're stuck within what's given to you. You're given a template, it's orange, you hate orange, nothing you can do about it, it's orange or nothing. Whereas if you know a little bit about coding, you can change the color. Well, it's a very basic example I'm giving you, but you get the idea. So there is an argument for some sort of very basic form of literacy. Having said that, I would add it in my list of literacies to acquire, I would put it down the bottom. I think there are more important things to do first. So that would come later on. Technical um, literacy includes not just being confident with using new tools and so on, but being able to accept that things are changing all the time. So maybe I've learned how to set up a blog in Blogger now, but guess what, suddenly Blogger gets sold or it's taken off the market and oh, it's gone. Accepting that and realizing that the skills that you've developed when you set up Blogger, you can actually apply those to the new one that comes along. So there's a kind of basic skill set that you build up over time. And part of that is also, I think often as teachers we're kind of we're worried about the fact that things are changing. I often hear teachers say, oh, but, you know, I can't keep up. It's a very normal feeling, and it's not going to go away. We will never be able to keep up. But we can know enough to understand that that's the way it is. You may have heard this expression that we are living in a time or a world of perpetual beta. You heard this? B-E-T-A? Beta? Do you know what that means? Beta? A website in beta? Yes, you, Luke's nodding. Can you tell us, Luke? Uh, well, it's one that's in development. It's being thrown out there just to see how it goes, just to check the functionality, and then fixing beta and then you can do this again. Yeah, exactly. So it's sort of unfinished. If something is in beta, it's in progress. It's unfinished. And often a product will be launched in beta. Users will be invited to use it and then to tell the company, oh, no, this didn't work. You know, try that. I hate the orange. Let's try blue. You can give your feedback. 
Um, it's B-E-T-A. I gave this talk before <laughs> in Japan, this talk. I mentioned this perpetual beta thing at a talk in Japan with a lot of North Americans, and one of them came up to me afterwards, and he said, what are you talking about? What's this beta thing? What's a B-E-A-T-E-R? What's this got to do with that? I don't know. So apparently it's beta in... Yeah. But it's beta in the UK, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, beta, beta. Okay. Any more questions there about focus on language? Some of these literacies? Yeah. yeah. Draft, yes, they could do, but they decided well, to call it beta. <laughs> yeah, I guess a rough draft sounds even less finished than beta. I, I don't know why the term beta was, was chosen, <laughs> but yeah, it's the same idea. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. To do with? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So texting literacy would include the conventions so that you use, you know, C-U, S-E-E, -E, you use C, and then U, Y-O-U, you use U, et cetera, right? Or the emoticons and so on. Absolutely. That would involve, uh, be involved in texting literacy, yeah. There is one I want to tell you a little about, uh, and that is hypertext literacy, because it's one of my favorite ones. And it very clearly indicates what a digital literacy is. Uh, hypertext, what is that? Or hyperlink? What is a hyperlink? Yeah, so when you read a, um, a piece of online text, there's a little blue word. You click on the blue word and it takes you somewhere else. That's a hyperlink. So hypertext is text with hyperlinks in it. Fine. What does this mean, hypertext literacy? First of all, that you know how to include a hyperlink. You know how to do it. How do you add one? You double click and you insert. How do you do it technically? But it's not just that. That's one part of digital literacy, the technical skill. Equally important are the social practices surrounding, for example, hyperlinking. For example, let's say we go to an online text and we start reading and every third, fourth word is hyperlinked. What's the effect of that? It irritates you. It's very difficult to concentrate. It takes away credibility from the text. Too much hyperlinking takes away credibility. What happens if we read a text and there are absolutely no hyperlinks? Let's say it's a scientific work or a report on something and there's nothing. Again, yeah, a couple in there would be good, but the writer needs to know what to hyperlink and what the effect is. So I think this is a great example of a digital literacy. On the one hand, you know how to do it. On the other, other hand, you're very aware of what's effective and what's ineffective and the dangers of too much hyperlinking or too little hyperlinking, and how to find the exact right amount, and it's going to depend on the text and the context. There's no one answer. I don't want to go through each of these one by one. It'll take us too long. Uh, let's look very quickly at focus on connections. Do you have any questions on those, on what they are? Netiquette, yes. Yeah. Hmm. For example, in network literacy, you need to know how to use social networks appropriately, which would include netiquette, and also how to contribute to networks. Um, I like participatory literacy as well. That one is the idea that you know how to uh, participate. For example, let's say you have um, a Facebook profile. If you do, could you put up your hand? Quite a lot of you, all right. If you use your Facebook regularly, can you put up your hand? It'd be a lot less. No, no, not bad, not bad, yeah, okay. So you have your Facebook profile, you know how to add a photo, you know how to do a status update, you know the technical part, but you also need to be aware of privacy issues. What photos are you gonna put up there? Who's reading your profile? Are your students some of your Facebook friends? If so, is that okay? Is it not okay? It's not like there's an answer here, I'm just saying, you know, these are considerations that you need to have. Also, what kind of identity are you projecting through your Facebook profile? How do you manage your online identity? What sort of persona do you try to project? And you may have a different persona depending on what you use. So your official school website may have a nice photo of you in your CV, let's say. Uh, your LinkedIn profile will be different to your Facebook profile, and so on and so forth. So we have these kind of multiple online identities that we need to know how to manage, and our students do as well, especially younger learners. So you need to know, if you're putting up your photos, let's say, on Flickr, let's say you're a, 
an amateur photographer and you like going around London and taking photos of London and you put them up on a site like Flickr, which lots of people can go to, how are they going to find your photos? You need to give them names, labels, tags. So you might have London, you know, Dawn, um, you know, pre-Olympics, whatever, whatever. You decide on your tags and then those tags or labels help people find your work. That's the, that's the idea. Okay, uh, the last one then, redesign, remix. Are you familiar with that word? Remix? No? Any music fans? Will will be? Yeah? But what do I mean by remix or what do we mean? Exactly, yeah. So you might take, for example, um, what was that, uh, that group of the 70s, the Sex Pistols, punk rock band. And they did a version of God Save the Queen, didn't they? They took a kind of a classic song, if you like, or an official song, and they made this punk rock version of it. That's a remix. Take something, take something else, put them together, and you create a new object from that. It originally comes from music, but it can be applied to all media now. Images, music, sound, audio, video, and so on. Now, remix literacy involves, first of all, understanding what the remix is. So what are the cultural references? For example, a Sex Pistols song, you do need to have a kind of cu cultural knowledge there to, to unpick what it means. Yeah? And what was the point of it? It was, it was very iconoclastic in its day, wasn't it? And people were, I think, upset. Some people were upset about it. It created a lot of debate. And that is often the aim of remix, is to... Mm, if you like, kind of break down taboos or show things in a new light, sometimes in a negative way, sometimes in a positive way, depending on your view, how you consume it. Oh, my screen has gone blue. So you need to understand Remix, and in today's world, more and more people are creating their own mixes of things and putting them on the, on, online. It's very easy to do. But as teachers, we can bring remixes into the classroom and use them as materials. Instead of the old course book reading activity, we can actually use remixed videos or songs to create um, debate, uh, do language work, and so on. And I want to just show you two of my absolute favorite remix videos. These are two different types. The first one is a type called a literal video. Have you heard of that? Come across that term? Yeah, somebody said yes. Was it you? Yeah, the guy behind you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, so instead of, you know, you have a video and then it's sort of the subtitles will tell you what's happening in the, in the shot. I'm going to show you one, a fantastic one. Uh, Harry Potter, has anybody seen the latest Harry Potter movie? You can, you can admit it, put your hand up, I have. If you have children, you're allowed to. Yeah, yeah, me too, and I loved it. Here's the trailer, a literal version of Harry Potter. Introductory helicopter nature shot. Bad guy at a safe distance. Second helicopter introductory nature shot. Bad guy at an uncomfortably close distance. Turn careful, Harry. He doesn't have a nose. Oh. Harry needs some sleep. And he I'm needs gone. a nose. And he needs some oh, sleep. Boy. And some new glasses. And he needs a manicure. Don't sleep yet, Harry, he's gonna kill you, look out! Failed out too many passengers, dramatic turn, how does that hold him up? First time he touched a girl, head up, up on the roof, roof. he's bad look, look right. right, this movie is extremely important. important. Force field dissolves dramatically, raise hand, that train is screwed, slowly look left. This movie is the most important movie you will ever see, back up in a library. Raise your hand and the one dragon's piss with his head of a bunch of bad guys, but he acts while he runs, runs. he's got a ride to tickets. Last guy on a bridge, swerve, run, throw, exploding. Running close to shot, cast a spell. Stop. Just be careful when that stick too late. Okay, turn now. Well, thank God. Okay. Catch my breath. Just grab it in his face, whatever. Okay, Did just have something worth it. Okay, okay, go. Dragon take up people running, downhill people running, flex. Part one November walking, chase that by you, wizards flying horse. 
Boy Scout Harry today got him, help him run. Far too do light to burning, people running backwards, screaming, wave hand up, skirt windy, kissing, snake cast bell, trying to blow up the town. Wizard lightning battle. You shiny pea, then other letters come out. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, this guy is very, very talented, and he has quite a few of these literal videos. I'll just give you a couple of moments again in your groups to think about how you might use something like this with students in the classroom. Just a couple of seconds. <laughs> Okay, any suggestions? You could expand the words so they produce a text, right? Right, okay, nice. Any more? Yes, it's extremely fast, yes, so they could actually read at the same time, yeah? Mm -hmm. Any more, thank you. Yes, yes. And then getting students to look at the language, different types of language, I don't know if it was past participles and use of adjectives or compounds, and then give them a trailer without that, and then use main stuff as a paper and perhaps some other trailer on slips of paper, and they've got to put them in all. Oh, nice. Lovely. Yeah, fabulous. Well, that's about a three-week project there. Fantastic. This <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday sorted out for classes. Yeah, oh, that is such a lovely IH lesson, I just have to say. I mean, as a you know, Excelta trainer, just, I just love the way the whole lesson's going. <laughs> Did you want to add something there, somebody? No? Opportunity for describing language, yeah. fiction language, um, brilliant, I think, for SME classes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, exactly, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Somebody wanted to add something here? Yeah, D everybody familiar with dictagloss? Yeah, of course, you're all IH teachers, yeah. Okay, thank you. Lovely ideas. Um, I think the point as well is to, first of all, students see examples, and then you unpick them in whatever way you want, language, also the cultural references, um, and then produce their own, which is actually, it sounds difficult and scary, but it's actually extremely easy. There's a wonderful tool called Overstream, overstream.net. It's a free online subtitling tool. And all you do is you say, okay, I'm going to use this YouTube trailer, easy to find, put in the address, boom, there it is, type in some subtitles, and then put them you know, uh, along the kind of uh, storyboard, if you like, where you want them to appear. It's extremely easy to use. You don't need any technical skills, really, to use these kinds of tools. And students have a great time. Um, I was working with a teacher in Seville with a group, and we tried this out, and she got them to produce um, a, a literal video for a Johnny Cash song. I don't know if you know Johnny Cash. I wasn't familiar. He's, he has this really boring way of singing. Well, maybe it was that song. But it's kind of, and the students not only produced the literal video, they sang. They sang the video. So they redubbed it even with their own audio. But I couldn't get permission from them to show it because it's kind of, you know, they were quite a low level group. And, you know, so, um, but the idea is certainly students uh, got, got right into it. Okay, so that's one example of a remix where we have an original trailer and then we have a kind of an overlay of fun stuff. Music videos as well. Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart is probably the most famous literal video. And it's on your handout. Do check it out. It's, it's a good laugh. All right, another kind of video. This is also my favorite. The Downfall. Yeah, do you know where that film was? Yes, it was about Hitler's last day. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Exactly. 
Yeah, they're really brilliant. Good. They're brilliant. Basically, this was a German movie which came out, I don't know, maybe five years ago. A very serious movie. Um, I think it won a couple of awards, and it's about Hitler's last day in the bunker, basically. And somehow this kind of meme or this little internet sort of mm, idea appeared whereby people started taking exactly the same scene from the film. It's the scene in which his lieutenants come in and tell him that the war is lost. And that's the moment where he realizes that this is the end, and then he goes into this kind of rant. People started producing these parodies where they would take exactly that scene and then they would subtitle it with silly stuff. So he'd be reacting to, to Fernando Torres' transfer from, where was it? Somewhere in Liverpool to Chelsea. Chelsea. Yeah, I don't know anything about football, but I was listening earlier. Um, and so on. Uh, and they just, they just took off. Uh, of course, the movie company, Constantine Films, found out about this, got very upset, and made YouTube take them off. So next thing appeared, there were a couple of parodies, the same scene, Hitler reacting to the Hitler parodies being taken off YouTube, <laughs> and so on. And at the end of the day, uh, they're still there. Every now and again, they go off. But in fact, it's not illegal to do that. This is the interesting thing about this. It's not illegal to create parodies and to use things and to, yeah. But there was a kind of a legal wrangling that went on for a while. So they were off for a while. Unfortunately, the whole internet community was in mourning, but they're all back now. And I want to show you my favorite one. My favorite one is, uh, it's connected to where I come from. I don't know if you've managed to spot my accent, those of you who don't know me. Yes, I'm South African originally, yeah. Been away a long time. Um, last year, was it last year or 2010, there was the World Cup in, in South Africa. And there was quite a lot of controversy over a kind of a plastic trumpet thing that people were using. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> the Vuvuzelas. Okay, so now we have Hitler reacting to the World Cup in South Africa and the use of Vuvuzelas. Okay, this. In Süden hat der Gegner Zossen genommen und stößt auf Stahnsdorf vor. Der Feind operiert jetzt am nördlichen Stadtrand zwischen Fronau und Pankow. Und im Osten ist der Feind bis zur Linie Richtenberg, Marsdorf, Karlshorst gelangt. Mit dem Angriff Steiners wird das alles in Ordnung kommen. Mein Führer, Steiner, Steiner konnte nicht genügend Kräfte für einen Angriff massieren. Der Angriff Steiner ist nicht erfolgt. Aber alle, 
soli sa fare da rimpezzare e di mai che le piotte si pezzare si fa che soffre e non mai che le piotte e tu che hanno e tu che ti sto le befelle sono in un vent che ho sprochen es ist unmöglich, unter diesen Umständen zu führen. Es ist aus. Der Krieg ist verloren. Aber wenn Sie meinen Herrn glauben, dass ich das in Berlin verlasse, irren Sie sich gewaltig. Er jag ich mir eine Kugel durch den Kopf. Tun Sie, was Sie wollen. Okay. Incredibly inventive. Also very, um, what's the word, controversial. The topic and so on, and there have been all sorts of complaints and uh, positive and negative reactions to this kind of thing. So remixes often are not easy. They, can, they bring up questions and they put people in uncomfortable positions sometimes, and that is part of their role, I think. This is also an interesting thing to do. I deliberately chose this remix because I like it, but of course it may not be uh, the kind of thing you want to show your students. You, you, you can decide. There are many, many, many remixes. Another very famous one is with Tony Blair and George Bush and that My Precious Love, do you know that song? I can't remember who that's by. My Precious Love, and it's made with both of them taken from speeches and so on, and it looks like they're actually singing the song <coughs> to each other. Um, so there's that kind of remix as well, political commentary and so on. Very easy to bring into the classroom, and again, get students subtitling things from a foreign language. You could find like a, you know, a Swedish movie if you don't have any Swedish students, preferably a language that nobody in the class speaks, and then get them to just, you know, they won't understand the dialogue, so they come up with their own subtitles. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that. That's a lot of fun, that one. All right, just to quickly wrap up, this whole thing of copyright and fair use, um, as I said, these parody videos were deemed to be examples of fair use. So parody and so on uh, is, is, is legal. You can do this. There's no problem there with copyright. Okay, just very quickly, the implications in about one minute. Uh, how to integrate this into the syllabus. In fact, if you think about it, it's not changing really what we do. We're just using slightly different tools. So we did a reading activity in the beginning where we used an internet site and then we just analyzed it. Producing videos like this is just like doing a writing activity, except we're just using slightly different tools. So it's not that difficult to actually integrate into a standard course book syllabus. Um, there is a digital divide, of course, not just between countries, but between students. So within a country, some having access to computers to work at home or in the class and so on, schools having more or less resources. Teacher training, this is my, my little bugbear, that teachers receive very little support, unfortunately, to integrate technology into the class. And it still tends to be early adopters or teachers alone trying out this kind of thing. But there are groups on the internet, for example, the webheads that you can join, who can give you support. Um, the student learning, the question, of course, is how much, the big question to ask is, is the effort I'm putting into using the tool worth the student learning that's coming out of it? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Assessments, if they're producing all of these great products, uh, will it tie into assessment, or is all of your teaching test-based or exam-based? Uh, and then keeping up as teachers, and the way to do this is to join uh, what are called PLNs. Are you familiar with that term? Personal learning networks. For example, Facebook groups or Twitter. There's a huge EFL community very active on Twitter. Uh, and th those can form your kind of support groups and help you keep up to date. These are big questions, and I don't have answers for them, and also it's lunchtime. So I'm going to stop there, um, and I hope you found that useful, at least food for thought, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you.